Good afternoon and welcome to Wednesday Wisdom Program featuring Bill Lito. Please welcome INSA Vice President for Policy, Larry Hanauer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Wednesday Wisdom with INSA. We're pleased to welcome one of our community's senior leaders to the program. Before we begin, let me make a few housekeeping notes. First, we hope to make this as interactive as possible. Please submit questions through the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. We have nearly 550 attendees this afternoon, and we'll do our best to get to all of your questions. Second, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. So as a reminder, this program is on the record. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Microsoft Azure, for their critical support of this program. We couldn't deliver this kind of thought leadership without the support of our partners. I'm pleased now to welcome Joe Schmank, Program Director for Microsoft Azure Government Cloud. Joe, over to you. Thank you, Larry. I really would like to thank INSA for hosting this program and for all that you do to keep the community connected. Microsoft's a proud sponsor of INSA, and we're committed to supporting the mission critical needs of the national security customers we all have. Our Microsoft Azure Government Cloud helps you do more for the mission with greater intelligence at the edge, unified security to protect the nation's data, and secure remote collaboration for analysts and tactical teams working around the world. We continue to bring new commercial capabilities to our dedicated Azure Government Cloud regions to meet the great demand for greater agility in the classified space. In addition to the secret government cloud that we offer, we've recently completed the build out of the new Azure government top secret regions. Now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. As director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, Bill Lietzow leads the agency's personnel vetting and critical technology protection missions, overseeing approximately 12,000 federal and contract support personnel worldwide. Additionally, he directs the development of an end-to-end -end national level information technology infrastructure designed to support the personnel vetting enterprise. Previously, Bill served as the director of the Personnel Vetting Transformation Office, where he managed the transfer of the National Background Investigations Bureau to the nascent DCSA and initiated and led associated transformational efforts. A retired Marine Corps Colonel Bill served 27 years as an infantry officer and then judge advocate, commanding at the company, battalion, and installation levels. Welcome, Bill. We're all really looking forward to the conversation today. Thanks, uh, Joe and Larry, and uh, uh, happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks to Microsoft Azure for supporting this program, as always. Bill, welcome. Um, we're really glad to have you with us today. We know you've got a lot on your plate, um, and so we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to share some insights. Um, I know INSA's member companies and a lot of others are interested in uh, some of the things you have to say, because, of course, the security clearance process affects just about everything we do um, in the trusted workforce. So um, so, so you've taken over uh, DCSA um, relatively recently, but the agency's changed a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, it's taken on investigative functions from OPM and the National Background Investigations Bureau. You've taken on counterintelligence and industrial security work uh, from legacy DSS, and you've expanded it. So tell us about the, the changes of the agency and the growth that you've overseen um, during your tenure. No, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. And it's a, it actually, it's why I'm so willing to do things like this, because I think uh, if, if the nation is going to get the value out of what, what came together here at DCSA, I really do need to explain it a little bit so people understand. Because it's even more than what, when you say changes at the agency, technically, it's the Defense Security Service changed its name to the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, and then it absorbed uh, some various components from seven or eight offices, bureaus, uh, depending how you uh, look at it. Um, but it really is more than that. It's really a completely new agency. If you think about it, for anyone out in industry who's been involved in mergers and acquisitions, it's kind of rare for a smaller company to absorb a much larger one. And that's part of what happened. The biggest changes that people are familiar with are the consolidated adjudication facility, 
National uh, Background Investigation Bureau, they came to join Defense Security Service. So just look at it from a numbers perspective. DSS was a 800 man organization, about eight, eight or 900,000 or eight, $900 million a year. Now it absorbs these two agencies and right then and there it became a 10,000 man organization, two and a half billion dollars a year, more than half of which is coming from a working capital fund that's, right. that's taking contributions from uh, over a hundred different government agencies. So that's really a completely different animal. So this is really more than just a growing <laughs> agency, it's really a new agency. In fact, on the, the wall outside where it shows previous directors, I got to somehow recognize to all the constituent uh, organizations that have come together that it's that there's no one senior one that in fact it's it's really a new agency you know the new emblem that i think is behind me if you well, the camera's pointed at it, so i hope you can see it yeah. um and and that really is the the picture here it's been a lot of change for what for me has been an incredible what i've learned is just an incredibly dedicated workforce everyone who takes over anything says that I've taken over a lot of organizations in the past. Some you've covered in my bio, there's others. I haven't said it to the degree that I uh, have said it and mean it now. This team from all the different constituent uh, entities that uh, were antecedent to DCSA has got security professionals that are just patriotic Americans who absolutely care about our national security like no group of people I've ever seen. That's what has kept us going through this period of pretty tumultuous change because we brought in, I mentioned those, uh, the three agencies coming together a little over a year ago. We've since brought in organizations from DMDC, DISA, our, our information security agency, from DIA, we brought in the, the polygraph school, we brought in SCIP accreditation issues, we brought in some um, overseas work. We brought in a lot of different components together, uh, legacy IT systems, a lot of complexity in this last set of transfers. One was in October in 2019, another in October 2020. That makes it hard on everyone in the agency. Yet while doing that, I'm, I'm bragging, I know you didn't quite ask me this, I'm just gonna brag about the employees a little bit. While doing that and going through COVID, they continue to improve on the performance of their mission. So yeah. I could not be more impressed with uh, the people that were, that are making up DCSA right now. Uh, we're using, you asked about how we're transforming, just to put the, the big picture is, we're using kind of a three-phased approach because it sounds nice in an alliteration, transfer, transition, transformation. You know, first we got all those groups together, made sure everyone got a paycheck the next day. So far, so good. Now we're transitioning and kind of getting the low-hanging fruit, the, the ways of gaining some efficiencies, merging offices, things like that. And then we're really looking at a more, fundamental transformation because we didn't get brought together just to reorganize. Right. We got brought together hopefully to to do things differently. And frankly, I didn't mention, um, you know, there's the transfer change, there's the COVID change. But the third one really is the policies have been changing based on an all of government approach, at least in the vetting, personnel vetting uh, situation, as many are familiar with, we're moving to a trusted workforce 2.0. So not only are we trying to improve the way we do things, but then we have to transform so that we can um, vet people, industry, contractors, uh, business systems that are classified. We do, that's what we do is we vet those and we vet them in a more intelligent way that fits 21st century threat picture. And, so, and so they're changing policies in the way we do business while, while uh, going through this transformation. So since you brought up the Trusted Workforce 2.0 uh, program, um, that was launched about three years ago or so to, to improve the security clearance policy framework. Um, can you give us a little bit of an update as to where that initiative stands and, and what DCSA's role in the Trusted Workforce 2.0 initiative is? Absolutely. Now, Trusted Workforce 2.0 covers the way we vet uh, the Trusted Workforce of the United States. So there's security clearances, which probably more in your INSA audience are familiar with. And then there's suitability clearances, you know, should this might not involve classified material, but gonna be a childcare worker or something like that. And so if you look across that spectrum, we're the, uh, what has happened is all of the departments and agencies that have a government workforce, including the contractor workforce when you're talking about clearances, 
they've been working together in a performance accountability council to try to improve the way we do this business of personnel security. And they have been doing it for several years. Uh, they meet regularly. DCSA has a seat at that table. We have a slightly different seat at the table. So you'll have DNI and DHS and DOD, obviously, and, and agencies, industry representatives, and everyone else coming together. And then we show up kind of as the implementer. Uh, if you think of the Joint Chiefs of Staff shows up at a National Security Council meeting, not necessarily with the same vote that the Secretary of Defense might have, not that they necessarily vote, but because he's, he's a provider of, uh, he's, he provides a capability, they could decide that we're going to vet everyone daily in every way imaginable. And I would have to say, no, we actually don't have a capability to do that. Uh, so we, we present the implementer's uh, picture on that. Trusted Workforce 2.0, for those not tracking, it's, it's designed to be a one, uh, a single system, a unified approach to uh, vetting. It focuses on only three tiers when we previously had five. So you have top secret, secret, and then just uh, a entry into the workforce uh, where, with a trusted person. And then, it, and then it has five scenarios. So there's your initial entry, and it all takes it through, you know, transfer to another job, upgrade your clearance, all the way to re-entry onto the workforce after there's been a period of time when we have to check you out again. Those are the five scenarios. I didn't list all five, but you can get the picture. But the, uh, the essence of this move is moving from a situation where we would investigate someone at one period of time, and then maybe five or 10 years later, depending on the circumstances, reinvestigate and confirm that they can continue to have that clearance now we're moving to a continuous vetting uh, scenario where we're looking constantly at uh, data feeds that will provide us a better picture and we can hopefully uh, nip problems in the bud and not have a, for instance, a Navy Yard shooter or a, a Snowden right. type of situation again. Right. So speaking of continuous vetting, I know that there are about two and a half million or so people uh, with clearances who are currently enrolled in continuous vetting so that, as you say, you can use a, a constant influx of data uh, to raise red flags if any have arisen, um, rather than just wait five years or 10 years till the next uh, reinvestigation. When do you think everyone can expect to be enrolled in continuous uh, evaluation or continuous vetting? Yeah, and, that's a, and how that's will a... that change the way in which you manage the clearances? Well. It's a that's a that's a great question, and unfortunately, I I can't give you quite as a, a pithy an answer as you might like. Because for instance, when you say there's two and a half million people enrolled, the goal is a, a trusted workforce 2.0 mm -hmm. with a number of data categories and and uh, data sets that we would be looking at on a regularized basis, sometimes daily. Right. Um, that's where we would like everyone to be ultimately. Right now, nobody is getting all of those uh, data checks right. on a regular basis. Well, there's, there are some people are, but it's, it's small numbers comparatively. So if I've got a, a 4.1 million person cleared population, ultimately maybe 12 million with suitability clearances factored in, we're nowhere near there. When you say we have two and a half million people in a continuous vetting, what we've done is we've recognizing that to get to that 2.0 with everyone in it, and we do believe in, a, in the next couple of years, we will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that requires some IT capabilities that are presently not available. I just adopted this October, the Enbis system that's been in the works since the data breach, right. uh, where the Chinese hacked into the OPM computer system. We adopted that, and as you can imagine, that is originally designed to replace an antiquated legacy IT system at OPM, built initially in 1984. It's, it, it was an improvement, a more secure platform, but that's when the policy was changing at the same time. So we just re-baselined this IT system this last spring, as soon as I took over as director, re-baselined it with a view toward meeting this trusted workforce 2.0 goal so it'll have additional capabilities that will allow us to get there but we can't build it instantly so what we've done is we've built a more manual capability that we're calling trusted workforce 1.5 and trusted workforce 1.25 okay. 
Okay. When you talk about two and a half million people in continuous vetting, it's the trusted workforce 1.25 that has the people continuous vetting. I still have a way to go to get those people all the way into the trusted workforce 2.0. In all cases, however, though, it does obviate the immediate need for a reinvestigation. Right. So, so we're going to focus more on the, and what we did, obviously, is we picked the highest value data sets, the ones that are going to give us the biggest bang for the buck, and also the least chaff, you know, mm -hmm. hits that are the, the wrong person that come too regularly, things like that. We take the most valuable data, we look at that. We can feel the greatest level of comfort. Everyone involved in the process agrees. Just getting those data sets is the 90% solution. We are more secure as a country with that today. But ideally, we're going to get it to a, an improved state. It will, it will take a couple years uh, to get there. And, and, and then the difference will be, once you're in the door, we're not going to reinvestigate every five years. So you're going to save tax dollars on that. Right. But we're going to be continuously evaluating and perhaps taking the kinds of adjudicative actions we might have to take for, for these incremental events in the person's yep. life to change it. So with some, I mean, a complex process to begin with and then adding continuous vetting uh, and all the data sets that that involves uh, on top of everything, uh, the computer system, the NBIS, the National Background Investigation System, is really sort of the, the key to all this. So what's the status of the system, uh, and you know, when will it be fully rolled out and, and fully online, um, and how are you going to use that system as opposed to all these legacy systems to make the process more um, efficient? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, it's a difficult question because we've, uh, you know, some of you also know we've just adopted the DIS program that came to the DIS system that was under development was owned by dmdc and we have a manpower agency and we've now brought it over to uh, dcsa we're going to have that that is online but we're making improvements to it because it wasn't really ready to take over for the its predecessor jpass some are familiar with all of these are going to come together and this will give us an end-to-end -end, uh, system Ultimately, for instance, and this will bother the people who are taking the time to enroll in DIS, DIS should be subsumed into NBIS as well. So you'll have one end-to-end -end system that initiates a background investigation. You fill out your SF-86 or whatever the appropriate form is at the time, and it takes us all the way through adjudication. So our adjudicators can also use the same platform, and we have a repository as well. So when you're doing visit requests when you're doing um, uh, transfers uh, of, of uh, eligibility for, uh, for uh, access. All of that can take place within the NBIS platform. Um, where are we on it? It's got to do two major things that weren't fully focused upon initially um, or, or over the years. It, you know, the, the problem being DOD was asked to build this for an OPM that was on the other side of the Potomac River. Um, you can imagine the difficulties one would have in getting the requirements appropriate, the funding needed to build it and everything else right. when you start with that scenario. But then the trusted workforce policies changed incrementally along the way. So when you put all that together, we got to a place where I decided in uh, spring of this year, actually uh, as in my previous job as PBTO, when looking at it and realizing Trusted Workforce 2.0 wasn't going to hit any uh, finish line when they thought it was without this. We needed to completely re-baseline the NBIS um, pro uh, project. We have done that, and I can proudly say I was just up at our milestone facility near Fort Meade, um, I think Friday, and I was giving out coins to a workforce that had worked through the holidays, working late into the night. And what I can say is for the first time in the history of the NBIS program, they hit, they've now hit three milestones since the rebaselining on time. Okay. Had never previously hit a milestone. So we now only have the platform built and a lot of great work was done before this race to rebaselining. Don't get, don't get me yeah. wrong. Uh, but it was to get a secure platform, cloud-based secure platform that development could take place on. And then they've been building and now we have actual capabilities that are rolled out. Our adjudicators are using them. Some of our uh, people in the continuous, uh, eval or continuous vetting uh, arena are using, and those capabilities are now 
available to some in Envis, and we yeah. have a, a plan that takes us to completion. One, to give us the trusted workforce 2.0, continuous vetting capability, right. but two, uh, just as important to replace that legacy IT system that was hacked into five years ago now. And I am holding that, I just adopted that one in uh, October of this year as well. And we're holding that together with Band-Aids. So right. yeah. we, have a, we have plenty of motivation to get NBIS working. Good. Um, I want to touch on one other uh, uh, clearance related issue before we move on to some of the other uh, missions that the agency has. Um, and I want to touch, uh, this was raised by uh, one of our uh, audience members, Jeff Selden, um, who asks about um, concerns about domestic violent extremism. Um, certainly, you know, the, the January 6th events at the Capitol highlighted the fact that some people who support anti-government violence uh, hold or have held in the past um, security clearances or positions of public trust. So does the, to what extent does the current investigation process enable DCSA to identify whether someone supports anti-government violence? Um, and in particular, given that a lot of these activities and ideologies are disseminated and organized on social media, does the agency have the authority needed to assess social media postings for affiliations with anti-government groups? Uh, great question um, from, from Jeff, but it's a hard question, so we should not invite him next time. The, um, <laughs> the, Sorry, Jeff. I, I was in fact just at a, a uh, up at Capitol Hill today, and there was very similar questions there um, because this is, for good for obvious reasons. I'll, I'll say this, right? Okay, so we already in our background investigation, uh, the set of questions that people answer, the investigations that are done, they're looking to root out anti-government violence um, potential already. That's been in place. There's nothing new there. We continue to do it um, and we will continue to do it. We now have an improvement to that system, continuous vetting. In the continuous vetting framework that we have in place, yes, we have we do find uh, we don't have a specific social media poll that looks for uh, these kinds of things. But for instance, we're looking for any arrest record. We're looking for incident reports that come from an insider threat hub. Um, a number of data sources that might indicate uh, this kind of a scenario. And for example, yes, we've had I, I we have had. Uh, clearance issues with people involved in the January 6th events that came to the fore because of the two and a half million you talked about that right. were in that trusted workforce 1.25, it worked. Right. It has worked and we have taken appropriate action that has included our industrial base. So that's the good news story. You asked more specifically about social media. Mm -hmm. Right now, I would say we have the authorities. Remember, I'm the implementer. So it's right. the it's there's a policy group that's looking at what we can should have to have authority to must look at with right. respect to social media. It's a it's a complicated area, um, and when we uh, I, I think right now we certainly have the authorities to look at what I have the ability to look at. Uh, we have run a few pilot programs with. A, a social media to see what capabilities, how much bang for the buck would we get? How much would it cost? How, you've got identity resolution issues. You've got uh, you, you've got you know how verifiable is the data that you're seeing on the that website? You've got all kinds of issues that we've had to clear through on our other data sources, um, and and we're continuing to run pilot programs. In the meantime, though, right now we use it mostly for specific incidents when there's an event that happens and we want to track more information to get a better feel before taking some sort of an adjudicative action. Uh, that's when we would use it. It's not a consistent and regular data pool across the right. uh, you know, population. So, so given though that the FBI director and others have said that, um, that domestic extremism is, is possibly the greatest threat we face uh, at the moment, is this something that's going to be a priority for you to do that sort of proactive um, uh, uh, pull, as you say, of social media data so you can identify people who might have anti-government tendencies before there's an incident or before uh, someone is able to you know, do something inside the, the trusted workforce tent? No, absolutely a, a priority. There's a, there's a bit of a question of where we're going to be able to leverage that the most. I mean, when you look right. at the, the workload of this uh, agency, you know, I have about 
uh, I won't say, but I, you know, in, in this low hundreds of industrial security specialists and counterintelligence people out among 12,000 facilities and, and a much larger workforce, you can only uh, put your assets in so many places, and, we, and that's why we need a intelligence threat picture to be able right. to focus our energies. We can't do it across the board. That the same is true with respect to um, the social media question. To give you a, a perspective on the on numbers, on the in the investigation side, not the continuous vetting, the adjudication, or the other parts of personnel. Right. Vetting, but just the ingestion of new investigations, we bring in about 10,000 investigation requests a day. Wow. So if you just did those and didn't even do the continuous daily feeds that might involve social media, you can see that quickly what becomes important is the ability to scale this. Right. And I can't scale it with people. I don't have enough people to be right. looking. No, you clearly something. need technology to be able to do that. I, I need technology and we're absolutely thinking ahead and we're building the ENVIS, National Background Investigation Service, systems, or service, I guess we already named it service. <laughs> the, we we're building that in a way that uh, will give us the capability as we get new machine learning, artificial intelligence capabilities, we can build it in uh, to that framework so that we'll be able to leverage it better okay. as we find better ways to, to tap into these uh, social okay. media. So one other data point that you have to identify uh, people with uh, anti-government ties um, is the SF-86 form. And in section 29 of the form, they, the, the form asks about people's associations. And it, you know, this dates back, I guess, to the 1950s when uh, the governor wanted to know if you were a, you know, a card, ca card carrying member of the American Communist Party uh, and you know, paid membership dues and all that. But nowadays with groups that are mobilizing mostly on social media, it, people don't you know, they don't carry a membership card. They don't necessarily pay membership dues. So does the SF-86 form, especially in the questions in section 29, need to be changed to elicit the kinds of answers you need to identify people with these kinds of ties? Or do the adjudication standards need to be modified to take into account this evolving threat? Um, because I come at this from a lawyer, I'm gonna get very technical. You said, does it need to be? Yeah. Uh, changed, and I'm going to say no. We're going to continue okay. doing our work, and we're going to successfully do our work with the current form. Right. So, but would it be more effective? I guess. Changed, yes, and I and should it be changed? I, I can say right now, and I don't want to get into somebody else's turf. We're not the policymakers, but we absolutely inform that policy, and you can bet we're looking for who answers that question, um, you know, in any way but the one you'd expect them to answer it with. And, and in fact, yes, there should be changes to the questions that we ask, the way we do investigations. There's no question about that. And the team is looking at that right now. The, the uh, executive steering group that's looking at the policies on behalf of the, the executive agent. The executive agent for security is DNI. Executive agent for suitability is, is OPM. And we take our policy direction from those two executive agents to determine what we put on an SF-86 when we launch an investigation, are we required to take fingerprints or not? That's that's uh, the policy that we implement. And right. as the implementer, you can bet we are making suggestions on improvements to the way those questions are asked. Right. Okay. I want to get to um, the counterintelligence missions um, that the agency has. Tell me about what you think are the highest counterintelligence threats to the to the defense enterprise, particularly regarding um, technologies. Um, I know uh, the department's heavily reliant on uh, technologies and components that are made overseas. Certainly, adversaries are eager to uh, to penetrate our supply chains. So, what what is the agency's principal uh, role? in protecting the defense enterprise from uh, from foreign supply chain threats um, and threats to the industrial base? That's a, that's a great question. It's, uh, it's one that I think needs more attention. Um, this is one I'd like to say, boy, I hope I could come back in a year from now uh, and, and give you a better answer of how we're addressing it. I think it's a- We'll put you on the calendar for February 24th, 2022. We can, we can talk about it again. The, uh, but no, it, I, you know, coming into this from the outside where I do, I've done, you know, I didn't come from any of the constituent uh, entities that formed DCSA. I think that was probably by design and I think it was probably a good thing. Uh, I come to try to make this organization work more efficiently 
So in that regard, the downside is I don't have a depth of knowledge in any of these particular areas. The upside is I kind of have a clear set of objective eyes looking at the various mission spaces that we're responsible for. And while I'm very impressed with the way the interagency and the whole of US government has gotten together to work personnel vetting and improve it, and they are improving it, we're gonna implement the improvements, that same attention has not been given to the counterintelligence uh, sphere and the critical technology uh, sphere to the same degree. Uh, we are, we have, I have launched within this agency a number of looks at these things we're um, we're working very hard to leverage the assets we have. I will say one of the reasons, one of the things I asked for in Capitol Hill today was, hey, look at the number of uh, critical technologies we're addressing. We sit side by side with industry. Yet, if you look at the if our ability to uh, get a good picture of the threat, um, we we have limited resources in that arena. I mean, I look at our mission sets as the, a product of a trusted person in a trusted workforce, a product of a trusted facility, uh, entity, uh, company, and trusted business systems, uh, cleared classified uh, systems. We, we vet to get those systems. I need a better threat picture because I can't focus on all of those threats, all the vulnerabilities. You know, we have gatekeeper, you can see in our emblem, we call ourselves America's gatekeeper. It's a great metaphor, but this is a lot more complex and more sophisticated than the medieval gatekeeper. The enemy's behind our lines already. The supply chain is not water and fuel and food and building supplies. The supply chain is software that's built overseas and software that has an ability to do things. It's not even, might go in a classified program, but it was not part of a classified program. So we have a good number of authorities in the classified sphere with the uh, controlled unclassified information. We have the authority at least to start looking outside of the classified realm. For instance, Operation Warp Speed, I had counterintelligence assets, industrial security assets supporting that mission quite a bit. Uh, that's outside, mostly outside of the uh, National Industrial Security Program. Right. But uh, we, are, we are not, situated right now to stop uh, what I our, our team estimates somewhere in the 200 to 500 billion dollar a year uh, hemorrhaging of technologies to yeah. potential adversaries today and we've got to up our game in that arena and we're and we're doing it that's yep. one of my highest priorities um, in uh, in looking at our uh, mission sets right now. So let me follow up on this with a question from someone in our audience, uh, Robert Ashley, former DIA director. Um, thanks for watching today. Um, he asks about supply chain, given the services focus on supply chain and CI issues, how are you teaming with the services to deconflict supply chain efforts? And they would seem to be a force multiplier given that you say it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to have the resources to address all of these, all of these issues. So months ago, uh, Bob Ashley and I used to attend meetings together and already he's turned on me uh, <laughs> after leaving uh, DIA. But it, it, it is a great question and we and that is gonna be part of, we have to team um, with not just the services, we got a team with uh, ANS, we got a team with all the, the whole acquisition community because there's several ways to, to work this. One, we can change the way we look we can one we can focus our counterintelligence efforts to be able to see where is the threat coming from and we line that we match that up with a vulnerability and make a risk decision there that and that's essentially what we do that's what this agency does in all of its right. mission areas but but we have to get smarter in the, in the threat picture mm -hmm. we have to be better leveraged with the other counterintelligence community in fact the the briefing i was just at on the hill was with the uh, military department uh, counterintelligence folks, where we have to work together more in getting a better threat picture. But the other thing is, as we look to close these vulnerabilities, um, you know, we have those authorities we have in the in the NISP, uh, but we also have to look at the authorities we can leverage much more quickly in contract, um, where we can put contract clauses in that will, for instance, close a very similar. Uh, maybe a, a, a bigger vulnerability that is a lot longer uh, stream to be able to change the uh, our authorities under the National Industrial Security Program. 
Um, so we want to, we got to leverage all of our tools and the tools that we can leverage the quickest require absolute coordination with the acquisition authorities across the services. I, I would like to say we're there. That's the thing that on February 24th next year, I'll be able to tell you about the, uh, the great cooperation we've had with those communities to one, shut off the vulnerabilities and two, get a better threat picture. Right. All right, it's a date. We'll put you on the calendar. Um, let me touch on another uh, mission that you mentioned at the beginning that the agency was taking on, and that's SCIF accreditation. Um, so the NDAA, which was passed in December, included a requirement that all contractor SCIFs and special access program facilities should be approved for co-use. So in other words, a contractor should be allowed to perform appropriately classified work in the facility, no matter which agency actually accredited it. And this will allow companies to make much more efficient use of, of scarce, secure facilities, which became a priority during the pandemic. So how will DCSA work as you take on the accreditation mission to implement this new uh, statutory requirement? Yeah, that, well, that's a, that's a great question. I think the, this, I don't think DCSA will have the authority to itself uh, implement all of the intent of that uh, statutory requirement because we can't, we don't, we don't have authority over how others deal with all skips. Well, what we can do is, again, we'll be an implementer. And, and uh, Bob Ashley gave us that uh, mission, or well, uh, before leaving, probably fully, or portions of it, fully recognizing that um, the benefit, the reason to move it to DCSA, among others, is one, we're security oriented, we already, do security of facilities. Right. Um, so this is an extension of that. It, it, there's a logic to it. But the other thing it does is it, it um, we are able to give a standardized way of doing business that once we get put in place, if we implement it properly, then it's going to, it, it'll facilitate being able to comply with that NDAA requirement. And, and I think we'll be able to do that. It's the same kind of thing we'll do with personal vetting, background investigations. We're now getting others asking us to do adjudications. If you have a standard process that's predictable and you can figure out how it's gonna work, you can use that process and then maybe supplement with your own process. Well, we're gonna have a polygraph take place after we get this package right. or something like that on the personnel side. Same would be true with skips. And, and the thing that we're doing, you asked earlier about working with the services, that's exactly what we're doing to prepare for the SCIF accreditation. We're planning on, uh, right now, it's still being, uh, the mission that we're taking on is still a DIA, the portion of SCIF accreditation that we take on is a DIA. We're moving it over, but we're working with the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the, the service secretaries and their shops to make sure that we implement it in a way that's consistent with how they'd want it implemented. And we end up with a pretty good baseline of, of how uh skip regulations are, in, okay. are working good we have about five minutes left so let me just run through a couple of questions that have come in uh, and maybe lump a few of them together and you can you can take on a couple at once uh there are two um two questions that relate to clearance issues um one from jose brandon asking about how we're going to improve the process of uh clearance reciprocity so uh, enabling people to transfer clearances among agencies more uh, efficiently and more quickly um and um another question comes in from Teresa thomas at mitre um, who says um, that she works with agencies to help them build a more neurodiverse workforce, focusing on talent who are on the autism spectrum. And the single most frequently asked question she gets is, what about clearances? Is there anything inherent to the clearance process that would disqualify candidates on the autism spectrum? Okay, that, those are the two? Those are the two. Yeah, so reciprocity uh, and um, uh, neurodiversity and clearances. I was hoping you'd give me more so I could skip the hard ones. Um, but I'm saving the rest for 2022. <laughs> the, uh, so, so first on the uh, on the reciprocity, or well, I'll start with the neurodiverse workforce and, and autism. I, I honestly, I have to look into that. I'm not familiar with anything that would preclude. Um, someone from getting a background, uh, a clearance based on that alone. You know, we certainly get the question, for instance, a lot with psychological issues and things like that. And we, of course, want to encourage people to get help. There's a, there's a, what we're really looking for is things that would cause a risk to the United States. 
and I have not heard, uh, but Teresa uh, may be familiar with more uh, instances where this could be a problem, but I've not heard of any specific uh, concerns being expressed that autism was causing problems with respect to clearances. Okay. Uh, I guess I guess it would depend on, um, you know, the specifics of any particular case. So I probably have to, uh, uh, that's probably all I can say on that one. With respect okay. to reciprocity, um, that's something, again, we don't control all of it because, of course, we're not making the reciprocity decision for everyone that may need reciprocity. We do make a lot of, uh, within DOD, reciprocity decisions were being handled within our adjudication section that was one of those constituents that came over from the uh, consolidated adjudication facility over at uh, Washington Headquarters Services. It's now part of DCSA. And one of the one of the earliest questions I was getting after taking this job without, you know, just trying to figure out what we're going to do about masks because COVID was starting, it was about reciprocity, and uh, and so we started digging into it, and uh, and people here were already digging into it because, like I said, we've got a workforce that is just always out there trying to improve the way they do work. It, it is impressive. And my adjudication branch had already done some Lean Six Sigma projects and started looking at how they could improve reciprocity. And I can say a year ago today, I want to say internal DOD, uh, when we were giving reciprocity to somebody that comes from another agency, we were averaging somewhere between 86 and 110 days to make that reciprocity decision. We're now averaging six days. Uh, to make the reciprocity decision, and we have good reason to believe that we will be able to uh, make it even shorter um, based on some technological capabilities we're putting in place. So we're doing that now. NBIS is going to help the entire uh, security enterprise of the United States do it even faster in the future for, for probably the same reason visit requests will go easier and things like that, because you'll have a single repository that other agencies can use and hopefully all would tap into at least for those purposes. So I think we've got a good news story going forward on that. Terrific. Um, one last question um, and we'll wrap up. So maybe in a minute or so, we have a question from Marcel Letra from Lockheed Martin, former USDI. Um, and he asks, if you could take out a clean sheet of paper and redesign the security and counterintelligence system from scratch, what are the one or two things that you might do? Well, that's the last question for minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I didn't ask you for the 78 or 79 things you might do. I just asked about one or two. Um, uh, well, I, in, in some ways, um, in some ways, we do have a little bit of an ability to do that uh, yeah. with this agency. I, I, I will say this, if you'd asked me even a year ago, but well, maybe not a year ago, two years ago in, in my past, did, was I seeking this job? No, wasn't it on my radar at all. Uh, you know, serendipitous uh, circumstances, divine intervention put me in a place where I'm here to take it. I could not imagine a better job. I, this is the importance of this mission, uh, of all of our mission sets, and its direct impact on national security on a daily basis. The fact that my team is in a fight today, we're not just collecting intelligence to, you know, for the future, we're uh, for a future potential conflict. Right. We are absolutely in that conflict today as we try to keep our industrial base secure and, and keep some of these things out of the hands of potential adversaries. That mission is awesome. And I, and you couldn't ask for a better time to come because we're coming as we're, as we're coming together as an agency. So we have a major initiative in place to put, to kind of relook at the operating model while we keep the missions going. So I've got, you know, right now we count them as seven mission leads. I kind of broke down the, you described it, I think as personnel vetting and industrial or, or critical technology protection. Mm -hmm. I've broken it into background investigations, adjudications, continuous vetting, insider threat, uh, critical technology protection, counterintelligence and training. We have a very robust training uh, right. program that we haven't uh, talked about much, but but all of those mission spaces, that was my transitional organizational chart. It was done for a purpose so that I could then turn to my chief strategy officer 
who comes from that PVTO organization I was part of, Personnel Vetting Transformationals, the job of which is to just not have to worry about day-to-day -day business, not have to worry about how we, um, you know, how we uh, operate daily to get our mission done better, decrease the timeline it takes to get a top secret clearance, which they've been doing great on, decrease the time to, to get reciprocity, they've been doing great on that. The missions are doing that. My chief strategy officer is looking at this whole operating model and where we can get the synergies. Um, I would say that starting, so that was the kind of long answer that we are doing that. We do have sort of a blank sheet of paper. We have to keep the airplane flying while we're changing it into a jet. But right. other than that, it's a blank sheet of paper. And and if I were to, the, the biggest thing that I think um, is has been missing in recent years is this agency and its antecedent uh, or offices and agencies, they were started out looking at vulnerabilities and, and they were looking at, hey, we're the gatekeeper. Is the gate gonna hold up? Uh, as opposed to looking at the threat. And so the counterintelligence component of this agency wasn't really even there many years ago. It's been growing since, but it hasn't grown enough. We're gonna have a new operating model, hopefully from that blank sheet of paper. But I would say one of the things is we've got to really emphasize the industry, the whole country needs to, not just DCSA. But DCSA needs to look at the threat picture better to be able to focus our efforts. And that threat picture, I would say from a national perspective, and certainly uh, Marcel Letra and, 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 and uh, Bob Ashley and the people that you've already uh, working with out there, they know better than I do um, how to improve that threat picture. But from a national perspective, my kind of less informed, uh, certainly don't have as much experience as, as your questioners do, but I would think they would agree that we have given a little bit of short shrift to the industrial security uh, portion of our of our intelligence focus. Right. That's the crown jewels of this country right now. That's where our adversary is focused. And when we build this new operating model, I want to be able to focus on that. All right. Well, maybe that'll be the subject of our next discussion uh, next year in February 22, or or maybe before. Um, Bill, I want to thank you today for your time. Really appreciate your insights. Um, thank you and your staff um, for all the good work that you're doing to keep uh, the nation safe. Uh, and to keep the workforce um, in, in, um, in good shape. So thanks very much today um, for all that you do. Um, so for all thank of you, you watching me. online as well, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for Microsoft to Microsoft Azure for sponsoring this program. Let me just look ahead a little bit um, to other INSA events. This Friday, in recognition of Black History Month, INSA's charitable arm, the Intelligence and National Security Foundation, will hold a roundtable discussion on diversity and national security in partnership with Cornerstone Government Affairs. Congressman Benny Thompson, chair of the House Homeland Security Committee will kick off the program, which will feature a panel discussion of leaders from the intelligence community, Congress, academia, and industry. Yesterday, INSA announced the launch of our inaugural 8A National Security Showcase. This June 8 and 9 virtual event offers the opportunity for 8A businesses to market their innovative national security technologies, applications, and services to procurement representatives from prime contractors and the 18 intelligence community agencies. As part of our showcase outreach efforts, INSA will hold a March 9 webinar, 8A and the IC, Big Opportunities for Small Businesses, that will feature small business representatives from NGA, from Wovenware, a successful IC 8A subcontractor, and IBSYS, a minority-owned small business active in the IC that's graduated from the 8A program. On March 10th, Dave Frederick, the executive director of US Cyber Command, will join us for a Wednesday afternoon discussion. And then on March 16th, the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Intelligence, Rear Admiral and Andrew Sugimoto, will join us for a Tuesday morning coffee and conversation. I'll be moderating that discussion, which I'm looking forward to. So as always, visit insaonline.org for full details and to register and to keep current on INSA news and programs. When the webinar ends, there'll be a short survey that pops up. Please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. This concludes today's program. Stay safe and healthy and have a good afternoon.